what we want to do is be a people who are people that are filled with joy. We want to have that fullness of joy. And what is that? And how do you get it? So we're actually going to go through seven surprising keys on how you can have the fullness of the joy of the Lord. But as we do that, I want to kind of give you a, a picture of what's happening with the world today. And, and, and really, also, what persecution is and what joy is. So you join me in prayer. Father God, thank you for everyone here. And Lord, thank you that you have them here for a purpose. Everyone here to be able to learn about you and the joy that you have for them. And Father, I, I ask that you overlook my inadequacies, edit what I have to say, be glorified in this morning. And we thank you for that. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, so let's go to the next slide. When we start a service, what I like to do is start with everybody standing up, and if you've got a Bible, open up to Philippians. Otherwise, just read along with me on this if you can, if you can read it. I know it's uh, not a very good uh, slide. I will read out loud. But if everybody could stand up, and we're going to read God's Word as we get into His Word on the subject of persecution and joy. So if you can see it, read along. Otherwise, get to Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 and 6. And then we're going to go down to Philippians 4, 4 to 7. All right, Philippians 1, 3 to 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then Philippians 4, 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Is that awesome? Everybody can sit down. <laughs> when we talk about, let's go to the next slide. When we talk about joy in times of persecution, how contradictory does it sound? It doesn't seem like the two can go, actually go together. It is, does it make sense? But here's the thing. Throughout Scripture, we read about joy and persecution. It's throughout Scripture. It's not just one or two places. It's throughout the Word of God. So why, why is that? There, there was an interesting thing, first of all, in regards to joy. If you notice one, uh, the song before the last, uh, the Phil Wickham song, uh, it said, There is hope beyond the suffering, joy beyond the tears, peace in every tragedy, Love that conquers fear. Awesome words. But you know what he did? He took the hope, he took joy, and he took peace, and he took love. Which we find in the New Testament over and over and over again. Because that's something God wants you to have a fullness of. That when people think of you, you're a person of love, you're a person of peace, you're a person that, that has this, this hope. And also, you have joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Throughout Scripture, we're reading about joy and a person of faith. And that's what we want to take a look at. So, persecution, you can also take a look at trouble and distress, suffering, disappointment, heartache, pain, losses. If you're going through a divorce, if you've been through a divorce and that pain there, there's often persecution with that. If you've got kids that are mad at you or you're mad at your kids, kids who aren't walking with the Lord, you've got a sickness, a pain, an illness. You've got uh, some type of uh, problems with finances and, and, and being able to get a job or holding on to a job, whatever the problems are. In those times of distress, can you have 
that fullness of joy? That is a huge question because the Word of God talks a lot about it. So we'll take a look. Um, let's go to the next. Persecution and joy. You got to remember one thing about persecution and written in the Bible. The early church was being persecuted. They were thrown in jail. They were whipped. They were lashed. They were killed. Persecution was common to the Christian. It was common throughout uh, the early part of the church into the Roman Empire. Christians were put on uh, on, on stakes and torched to death. Christians were thrown to the lions. Throughout the world, in the past and today, there's persecution. That means prison, death, and fear. Just think of it. We're sitting here in Calvary Chapel Inland, and we're one of the few places anywhere in the world where we don't have to worry about the police or the military storming in here and arresting you, taking your Bible, locking you up. That's pretty amazing. You know, America is incredibly an exceptional country because we were founded by people coming to Jamestown for the first time because they wanted to worship God according to their conscience. People throughout the world from the beginning of, of, of America, sorry, <laughs> from a, my wife always warns me not to put the notes in there. <laughs> we were founded for people seeking refuge from the persecution of Europe and other parts of the world. And, and so we, we, we have a country whose constitution was designed to protect people of faith. We have a constitution that says that we have First Amendment rights. It was right into the Declaration of Independence that we could worship God and be able to do so without worry. In places in, whether it's South America, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia, Brothers and sisters in Christ are not experiencing that. They're experiencing a persecution. Yet, they have joy. There's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody happen to get with that? You have? Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's this thick book. And you know what it is? It's one story after another of the early church of people who were killed, burnt at the stake, whatever it was, they were killed. It was their stories, one story after another. Hundreds of Christians. And you know what? What was common was that they had a joy that nobody could understand. And the pain, the anguish, the horror of the moment. What's wrong with that person? He's smiling. What's wrong with that person? He's singing praises. What's wrong with that person? There's a joy that makes no sense to the world. How can somebody who's suffering have joy? How could you, going through your heartache and pain, your problems, how can you have joy? Well, we're going to look at the key to that. And when we take a look, it says, In 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not saying may be persecuted. If you're living a godly life, there's going to be some type of negative consequences from somewhere unless you're a monk hiding and nobody's around you. There's going to be consequences to standing for truth. In a society that relativity, uh, relativism is the God, where tolerance is the God, and you say that there's one true way to heaven through Jesus Christ and the blood for him dying on the cross, that goes against our culture. And, and we're seeing a greater uh, amount of persecution. Acts 4.19 If you take a look at Acts 4.19, what happened was this. Peter and the apostles were told, you cannot 
go out and talk about Jesus Christ. And they were told, don't talk about Jesus Christ. And you know what they said? It's better to obey God than man. It's better to obey God than man. In Acts 5.11 they, in regards to the persecution the early apostles were, were, were experiencing, they said, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor in his name. We read about Paul and others in jail singing worship songs of joy. In jail? I'd be saying, get me out of here. This is unfair. They're singing praises. And the guard's going, what is this? Next. We see the word is rich about rejoicing and joy. But what is it? You know, 1 Peter 4, 13 says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Wow. Somebody may mock you, make fun of you, torment you, isolate you, not have anything to do with you because of your stand for Christ. We're to rejoice at the fact that we're counted worthy. Matthew 5.11 says, Blessed are you when men revile and persecute you. What is he talking about? We're to rejoice when people are angry and mad at us? In Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. Awesome, I want to know Christ. Everybody likes that part of the verse. And then it says, And the power of his resurrection. Every one of us want to know the power of his resurrection. But then it says, and the fellowship of his suffering. In that fellowship of his suffering, you can have a fullness of joy. Next. Worldwide, brothers and sisters in Christ are being persecuted. They're suffering. You know, you've heard about ISIS. You've heard about the Islamic State. In, in Syria and in Iraq and wanting to expand. And there's a massacre, a genocide against brothers and sisters in Christ. As we sit here now, we have Christians being killed. As we sit here now, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering like you can't believe. You think you have trouble? Just think, if we went to your house, and we put it in on your house. That's what's happening. When the Islamic State terrorists come in to a town, they put an N on somebody's house. What does the N stand for? Anybody know? Christians throughout the world are wearing this N in solidarity with their brothers and sisters who are suffering. The N in Arabic is that symbol up there on the left. That's the N in Arabic. N stands for Nazarene. The radical Muslims are, are saying they're Nazarenes and they have three choices. You either pay a tax nobody can pay because it's so high, or two, you renounce your faith in Jesus Christ and accept Islam, and we'll let you go. Or three, you're going to be beheaded. So there are people being beheaded all over the Middle East right now. They're being crucified. Wives are seeing their husbands killed. A mother is sitting there, renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, or we're going to cut off the head of your child. And the child's head is cut off. What would you do? How would you stand up to that type of persecution? But that's happening right now. You've got people who are fleeing for their lives. They're leaving their home 
everything. They're leaving their cell phones. They're leaving all their jewelry. They can't take anything, and they have to walk hours, days, sometimes weeks to find safety. And what happens when they get there? It's everything in shambles. No water, no food, no clothing, no, no nothing. They've lost everything, and there's no nothing, nothing for them. I have on my website some Syrian Christians who are, are standing in a bombed-out church where, just like this, where babies and people were killed because of the explosion. They were back in the church before they fled. They had a guitar just like that. And they were singing, maybe a half a do- about a dozen people on this website. You know, blessed, um, bless the Lord, oh my soul. The song that we sang. You know, and they're in pain. But they were rejoicing in the Lord. Not the circumstances. Rejoicing in the Lord. Now, if this, if the Lord puts on your heart, I have a petition where we're meeting with a number of Congress people to help our brothers and sisters in Christ because right now the State Department and the military are doing nothing to help these people. And so they've got different things they're doing, but they're not helping them. So, Shelly, you want to pass out the, the petition? If you could sign that, that would be awesome. Uh, We were able to help free a Christian that was in Sudan jail, a mother who was going to have a 100 lashes and be hung. She had to have a baby chained to a bed. And the embassy and the State Department did nothing. So we got a petition together, and we got both not just conservative Republicans but liberal Democrats to agree. We got this together together. And within 24 hours, we were, uh, she was freed. And we want to do something, yeah, we want to do something here. So we've got, not just there though, in North Korea, over 90% of the Christians are in prison camps, in work prison camps where they're forced labor. In China, churches are being bulldozed, actually bulldozed as well as people arrested. In Iran, you all probably have heard about the pastor, Sadid, who's in, in prison, but there's many more. I have a picture up here of Bibi. She's one of just hundreds of, uh, in Pakistan, thousands if you count the Middle East, that if somebody accuses you of attacking Muhammad or the Koran, you're called a blasphemer, and it's by death. And, you, you know, she's a mom of five, Somebody didn't like something she, she did that accused her of blasphemy, and she's been sentenced to death to hang. And the Christians are silent. The government is silent. We need to pray for these people, whether it's in Afghanistan, in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Iran. These are the worst offenders, but you can go all over the world. Next. And then here in the U.S., these two kids, um, did we skip a, a slide? Or was that the next one? Okay, I guess we're okay. Okay. Uh, about the U.S. today, there's multiple attacks that most Christians even aren't aware of here today. I'll just give you a couple of these real quick. As you know, as our culture changes, you're going to see very few TV or radio commercials about Merry Christmas. It's all going to be happy holidays and happy holiday trees. You're seeing that uh, uh, that fairness doctrine up there. We were two votes away on the SEC from outlawing Christian radio, actually taking Christian radio off the air. We have here uh, uh, where it says, "Read that." That just came out. PJ Media, I, Idaho City threatens to jail ministers for not performing gay weddings. They just posted that. Yeah, just posted. So this is happening in cities where Christians are not voting for city council. Others are. And so in Houston, what happened in Houston, may, some of you may know. 
In Houston, they passed an ordinance that the churches violates the church's biblical beliefs. In Houston, they had a subpoena to the pastors to ask for their texts, speech notes, uh, emails, everything. Which is a way to silence pastors from speaking truth. And the government shouldn't be involved in that. But that's happening now in city after city. We have uh, in the national parks, if you want to go to the national park and have a baptism, the government says it's illegal. We have a command as Christians to help the hurting, the broken, the hurt, those who need, who are homeless, those who have needs for food, clothing. We're, we're to reach out to them. But the government says that if we do so, and we've got any type of indirect aid, we can't say Jesus loves you. This is in the name of Jesus. It's the idea of, here, here's your, your food, but we can't say it's in the name of Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. In Cal State colleges, in the admissions, if you're a graduate of Calvary Chapel high schools, you could be a straight-A student, but you can't go into the Cal State University. Why? Because your textbook talked about God's providence. And because your textbook talked about intelligent design, you have to take secular classes to be admitted. And, and, and uh, soon we're going to have the churches losing their tax exemption. All these different things are happening. Next. So these, these kids were told, shut up in class. You can't talk about Jesus. Next. And then one of the most recent things, let me just give you a few more to paint the picture that persecution for the first time in American history is really starting to happen right here. How many of you have known of a college called Biola? Biola is a Christian college. They have a biblical doctrine. Biblical doctrine says there's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. But according to the government, that's discriminatory. It says for the kids, homosexual behavior, just like sex outside of marriage between a, a boy and a girl, if it's outside of marriage, that is a sin. And they also have a doctrine that says, as a uh, believing that uh, homosexuality is not sanctioned in the Bible, that marriage between a man and woman is, that we do not allow teachers and staff to <laughs> hold to homo, uh, homosexuality. So that's their doctrine. That's their belief. An executive order was uh, given a couple of months ago from the White House, and now the New England Board of Accreditation, that accredits all the colleges in New England, says that Gordon University, which is the Biola of back east, has to change its entire policies and not stand on the Bible. They have a year to decide, and if they don't comply, they lose their accreditation. So we're seeing where Biola and Azusa and... Uh, uh, all the Wheaton, all the different Christian colleges are about ready to lose their accreditation. We're seeing here in America that I, when I accepted Christ, I was over at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa at the tent. And I was going to school and I got plugged into a thing that, you know, uh, they, they talked about coming to the church to have the induct, inductive Bible study. I got plugged into inner varsity that taught me how to do inductive Bible study. InterVarsity, Campus Crusade, um, Navigators, all the Christian clubs are outlawed from Cal State Universities. They were kicked off campus about a month ago, and <gasps> nationwide, most colleges are doing that. Christian clubs can't be on campus because they won't comply with political correctness. That's not what the First Amendment talks about. That's not religious freedom. And so we see uh, uh, the CEO of Firefox had given a $1,000 donation to Proposition 8, and he was fired just earlier this year. We see 
over a, a couple hundred florists, uh, bakers, people who make T-shirts. They've taken a stand that, hey, we love the homosexuals and we love the lesbians and we believe that uh, you know, God loves them and we, they, God wants them to accept them as their personal savior. And so like the baker in, in, in Denver, he bakes cakes for homosexuals, he bakes cakes for lesbians, but when he was asked to bake a cake for a gay uh, wedding, he said, that violates my conscience, I can't do it. So he was fined, threatened with jail, told by the judge he had to do it, and was ordered to go to a counselor, which is like re-education camp you would have in communist China. Next. This is a couple that owns a photography studio and video studio. And in what they do, they had a, a, a lesbian couple that was a client, and they took pictures of them and stuff. And then that lesbian couple said, we want to get married. And she said, you know what, I can't do a good video for you. And, and my conscience, my belief that marriage is between a man and a woman, I can't do that video. And they took her to court. And she went through different appeals up to the New Mexico Supreme Court, the highest court in New Mexico. And the court said she had to perform the wedding or go to jail. This is what the judge said. This is the price of citizenship. Christians must compromise, if only a little, to accommodate the contrasting values of others. The early church said, we've got to obey God, not man. The judge and the politicians are saying, we have to compromise. So we're, we're finding Christians are being persecuted today. Next. The church is being redefined because of the issue of tolerance. Today, tolerance is taught in schools as the most important thing. And so we're being taught that Christians are intolerant. We're violating people's civil rights, and so we're seeing persecution. And what's interesting is it was the early church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it was the early church of Jesus Christ where in the culture of the early church, babies were thrown on the side of the road and left to die. Old people were thrown on the side of the road and left to die. Sick people were thrown on the road and left to die. That's the way they treated people. The Christians came along and picked them up and nursed them and adopted the kids. It was the Christians that started adoption, started education, started the hospitals. In the early church, we were defined as Christians because we were Christ-like. We were known by our love. They, and, and, and these people have a love. You know, when you walked into the church, when you, for, for maybe the first time, did you notice the love these people had for one another? That there's this kind of joy? This is what we're known for. But we're being defined as a people who hate. And so... In Rome, what's interesting, it almost go, you know, it says there's nothing new under the sun, right, in Solomon. In early Rome, the Christians were called haters of humanity. They would torch the Christians, kill the Christians. We were called haters of humanity because we were contrary to the normal politics of the Roman culture. Next. And so there's an, even an assault on tax exemption. And, uh, and it, it's very possible this church is going to lose in the next two years its tax exemption. All the churches are. Next. You know, Charles Finney of the Second Great Awakening said, God cannot sustain this free and blessed country which we love and pray for unless the church will take right ground. Politics are a part of religion in such a country as this, and Christians must do their part of their duty to God. And Proverbs 29, 2 says, When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. And when the wicked rule, the people groan. You know, just as an aside, you heard about that New Mexico court judge? It's really the Christians who put him in power to be able to dictate that Christians must compromise. 
We have two judges running for California Supreme Court who want us to compromise and want to take our, away our free amendment rights. And that's one of the reasons why we're having the election forum after lunch this afternoon. So you know who they are and you know how to vote. So I hope you uh, do so. Because here's the thing. Too many times Christians are the ones who are allowing our society to drift away. Because either we vote against our values or we don't vote. Let me just give you a quick example. Everyone, please stand up. I'm going to do this illustration this afternoon, too, but I, I, I want to do it this morning. So look around. Pretend this is the entire church in the United States. See everybody who's here? And this represents all the Christians in the U.S. So what I want to do is I want this side to sit down. I want you guys to sit down. And we're going to have this first row sit down. Oh, you sit down too. All those sitting down represent the evangelical Christians in the U.S. who are not registered to vote. <laughs> this represents all the Christians not re registered to vote. Now, I want you guys all to sit down. You guys in the back sit down. And um, um, yeah, this is about right. Maybe, maybe you guys can sit down, this row here. These are the Christians who are registered but did not vote. These are the Christians who did vote. We're finding our First Amendment rights being eroded in the cultural drift because Christians are not doing their duty to take responsibility under Romans 13. Yes. Next. So 12 million Christians are not registered to vote. And out of those... 40% of the Christians voted in 2012. 60% did not vote who are registered. What would happen, you know, however you feel about the last election, uh, the election was won by a couple of million votes. We're talking about 12 million not registered. We're talking about, you know, another, uh, um, what, maybe 30 million who did not vote. We could transform this community we could transform this local area the state of california and nationwide we could be a voice for the persecuted church worldwide we could be can you imagine a congressman or senator or assemblyman or state senator or a judge on their knees praying asking god for direction on their knees praying and asking god to help them make a wise decision can you imagine Democrats and Republicans holding hands and praying? It's because the Christians are not voting. We're finding ourselves slipping further and further away. Next. So going back to persecution, how do you personally react when you're under persecution? How do you react when there's trouble and disappointment to this war on Christianity. How do you react to the lost, the broken, and the hurting? Next. Persecution and joy. It, it is so strange that the Word of God talks about that in, in, in such a way. But when we take a look at this, John 15, 20 says, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Paul to the Corinthians said, I am exceedingly joyful in my persecution. And John 16, 33 says, I have said to you, uh, the, uh, said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face trouble, tribulation, distress, dangers, and persecution. But take courage, I have conquered the world. Throughout scripture, this thing is together. And, and, and here's the thing. We, we have to take a look at what this biblical doctrine of persecution is and what it is as far as being a people of joy. Next. Habakkuk 3.17. Here's an incredible section. The, the nation was collapsing. 
not too different than our nation, but it was collapsing far worse. People were hungry and starving. People didn't see any hope. It was like there were enemies on the left and enemies on the right, enemies behind them, and enemies before it was just collapsing. So here, where he should be saying, I give up, there's no hope. Look what he says. The fig trees might not bud. The vines might not produce any grapes. The olive crop might fail. The fields might not produce any food. There might not be any sh- uh, sheep in the pens. I mean, devastation for these people. There might not be any cattle in the barns. But I will still be glad because of what the Lord has done. He remembered what the Lord had done for him. He remembered what the Lord can do. And he, then he goes, God, my Savior, fills me with joy. The Lord and King grieves my strength. In other versions, it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Guys, I don't know what you're going through, but I can tell you the joy of the Lord is your strength to get you through a divorce, a recovery, a kids in rebellion, a sickness, money problems, whatever you're facing. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Next. But the angel, Luke 2.10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news, a great joy. That will be for all the people. And 1 John 1, 4, he says, We write this to make our joy complete. In Psalm 16, 11, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You know, when we take a look at these, joy is absolutely central, absolutely central to the Christian experience. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's evidence. Joy is an evidence of God working in your life. The first words Paul uses to describe love in Galatians, he talks about joy because it's a fruit of the Spirit. You know, and when we think of Christ dying on the cross for us, shedding His blood, your sins being forgiven your sins put upon him the punishment put upon him and his righteousness put upon you this is a a a thing that is the basis of that joy what great joy in knowing our sins are forgiven what great joy knowing that we're in christ jesus what great joy knowing that we got god's mercy and grace you know joy dominates the scripture. Do you know joy is 600 times in scripture? It talks about joy. That in joy, 233 times it talks about joy, but only six times about happiness. You see, the word of God, you can find a difference between the idea of happiness and joy. It's not the same thing. The world pursues happiness. Christians have joy. What does that mean? Happiness depends upon your happenings. I get a date, I'm happy. I get a raise, I'm happy. I get married, I'm happy. I get, uh, uh, you know, retirement, I'm happy. I, my baseball team wins, I'm happy. I hit a home run, I'm happy. You know, there's different things that make me happy. But what happens if that person you're asking on a date says, no, I'm not happy? What happens if instead of getting that raise, I get fired? I'm not happy. See, happiness depends upon circumstances, doesn't it? You can be happy one day and then sad the next day. You can have trouble one day, but just everything's going great the next day. That's happiness. But joy is a constant. Happiness is temporary. Does that make sense? Joy transcends the circumstances. And so it's quite a bit different than the circumstances. Happiness can change in an instant. Because it depends upon the circumstances. You can, uh, it changes a sadness, sorrow, worry, envy, greed, boredom very quickly. And here's the thing. The world out there who does not know Jesus Christ, they don't know what joy is. They can't experience real joy. They can experience happiness. Joy can't be found. It can't be found. 
you can't even really pursue it because it's a gift. Joy is a byproduct of having a right relationship with the living God. Thus, in the middle of persecution, in the middle of disappointment, in the middle of trouble, you can still have joy. Does that make sense? Joy is different than happiness. And so when we talk about this, joy exclusively belongs to Christians. Augustine said, and let me quote him here, there is joy which isn't given to the ungodly, that of those who love thee for their own sake, whose joy thou thyself art, and this is the happy life to rejoice in thee and of thee. This is it, and there is no other. Joy comes from God. Let's go to the next. So you can have different types of display of joy, different types of ways of describing joy. Um, when we talk about joy, um, we can be talking about uh, smiling faces and great circumstances, but joy is something that is just independent circumstances. Okay, next. So what is joy? It's the unchanging nature of God and our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a fruit of the Spirit and the foundation of our relationship. Knowing our loving Father is key in recognizing He ultimately controls everything. When you have that perspective, you can have joy. Next. So the key focus here Expect persecution, but your joy is independent of it and it comes from God. And you can experience God's fullness despite the circumstances and create powerful change in your life and powerful change in others' lives. Next. So we're going to go and take a look at seven ways you can have joy. These are the keys to opening up the joy in your life. Maybe there's something blocking that joy in your life right now. The first thing, of course, is knowing that you need to be in Christ Jesus to be able to tap into that. Then second of all, here are some of the keys that you need to have. First of all, despite persecution or trouble or circumstances, the key now is to recognize God's awesome attributes. Who is God? Who is God? Just think about it. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He knows everything that's going to happen. He's able to do anything he wants. Nothing catches him by surprise. He's eternal. He knows the beginning from the end. He's a God of love. I mean, this is a God, when you study who he is, that in itself creates, in any circumstance, a feeling of joy. Next, he's in control. Just think of this. Remember Joseph? Joseph, here's, here's a kid who his brothers have betrayed him. He's thrown into a pit. And what happens in that pit? It's so unfair, he shouldn't be in there. And worse, they sell him into slavery. He's taken away from his land. He's put in a foreign country, and he's then a slave there. And then he's falsely accused again. And what happens? He's thrown in jail. And finally, after years, he thinks he's getting out. And he's, he's forgotten. He's got to be in jail even more. I mean, how beyond frustrating. You think he'd be the most angry, most frustrated person and just shaking his fist at God. Everybody around him goes, this man's amazing. Because he didn't let the circumstances get him. He knew who God was. And finally, what happens, he's exalted to the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. He saves Israel. He saves his family. His brothers come. They don't know who he is. He reveals who he is. They think, oh, man, they're going to kill me now. And you know what he said to them? You meant it for my harm. God meant it for my good. He recognized God in the midst of unfairness, was still in control. He recognized Romans 8.28 that says, and we know 
that God works all things to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Next. Number two, we need to cultivate a servant's heart. A foundation of a Christian life is really contrary to our human nature. Our human nature wants it to all be about us. The Word of God says we're to have a servant's heart. You know, Philippians 2, 5, 7 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our motto is to serve others and to have a servant's heart and not have everything be about us, but look out for the needs of others and be willing to help out. Next. The third key to joy is making a prayer a priority. Psalm 1611 says, You will make known to me the path of life, In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We are commanded to be in prayer, and and that's a time when God can minister and direct and help us and lift us into a state of joy. Next. And then number four, consistently studying and obeying God's word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy, and my delight of my heart For I have been called by your name, O Lord God, God of hosts. And John 15, 9, 11 says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We need to have, we can get joy as we learn and know God's word, as we hide God's word in our heart so we don't sin against him. Next. And then number five, we need to be actively involved in fellowship. The word of God warns us not to forsake the fellowshipping together with with other believers. That's Hebrews 10, 25. That we need to be plugged in with brothers and sisters. So when we're down, they can pray for us. When uh, they're down, we can pray for them. We can minister to one another. And if you try to go it alone, you're going to be caught up in your circumstances. Next. And then number six, we need to pursue effective evangelism. First Thessalonians 2.19 says, For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? We can find joy in telling people about Christ. We can find joy when they accept Christ as their personal Savior. It's awesome. And God's just made us that way. That The Bible says when one person comes to salvation, the angels in heaven rejoice. And we need to be rejoicing when somebody becomes a Christian. And then finally, we need to be an instrument of love, a catalyst change. John 13, 34 to 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We need joy and we need love. And we need to be able to reach out. I mentioned about the broken, the hurting, the homeless, those people who are addicts, those people who are uh, destitute, those people who are in need. We need to reach out to people with whatever resources God has given to us, with time, love, money, whatever it might be. We need to be a church that fulfills our commission, not only of uh, telling others, but demonstrating our love by giving our time and our resources and our efforts to help those in need. Next. John 16, 20 says, I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. 
your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born in the world. So with you, now is the time, your time for grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take your joy away. Your joy can be challenged by Satan, but no one can take your joy away. That's a promise. Next. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Guys, when Jesus died on the cross, when he suffered that pain, that anguish, as he took on this, your sins, which is indescribable, taking on the sins of the world. It says, for the joy set before him. You are the joy set before him. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are his joy. Why he was on the cross. How awesome is that? Next. What we need is renewal in our life. And from that, we're going to have to be people of repentance. And from that, we can find revival. My prayer is that there's revival in your life. That as we pray, as we end uh, this morning, you go out so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that you will be filled with joy, a new vision, and a new hope, and be able to apply these seven points to your life. Because you can start within this town, in this county, a revival. I'm praying that in this church there is a revival, and those of you who are visitors, there's a revival in your church, that we're going to see a revival across America. Next. Before I have my wife come up to pray, I just want to say one thing. Uh, we we uh, have a place up at Lake Arrowhead. And up at Lake Arrowhead, there, there's this area that's my wife's very favorite place to hike to and pray. And it used to be a stream of water, just beautiful living water, little fish and frogs and flowers and everything. And a rock came down and blocked the water these big boulders. And so what you see is dead water. Green, algae, no flowers, no fish, no life, just dead water. And so many of us, kind of that's our life. The living water is not flowing through like it could. We're stagnant. We don't have the joy. We don't have that, that, that incredible joy of the Lord because something's blocking it. Something's in the way. And so my prayer is, that as my wife comes up, that boulder that's holding that joy out of your life would be blown up, and you're going to be transformed.